Hello and welcome to SME TV. I'm your host, Angela Vithoulkas, bringing you the latest in news and views for the SME community. This is our friend or foe segment. If you think there are wrongs to make right, that there are people or companies who do the wrong thing for the wrong reasons, and you want to change that, then I know a couple of people, myself and SME TV included, who will stand with you. And stay watching to meet them. Please remember, by subscribing to our YouTube channel, you're showing your support not just for us, but for all SMEs. And we encourage you to comment and share SME TV. Today's guests are ESG researchers. ESG is the environmental, social and governance factors that are used to evaluate a company, non-financial factors. But I think they should be called business archaeologists because essentially they find out how a company lives, how they behave, they expose who they really are. So you can determine if you want to invest or be associated with them. Joining me today is Madison Johnston and Michael Fraser, both co-founders of Diligence Research and Operation Redress. Welcome to you both. Hi. Thank you for having us. Not at all. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for joining us. Now, I sound very excited because I'm a huge fan of the work that you're doing, but this is really serious work. So I, I, I don't mean to convey how excited I am at the good news, but how excited I am of the kind of work that you do and the advocacy role that you play, whether you intend to or not. Madison, I'm I'm going to put you on the spot first, um, but I want to highlight that as part of the work that both of you do in your business, your researchers, your consultants, your advocates, and then you have the software component. So we're going to cover all of those. We don't have a lot of time. But first of all, Madison, I'm, I'm going to take a direct quote from you because I asked you both on your advocacy roles and, and why you do it and what you do it for. And I'm quoting Madison now. A lot of people who become advocates, ad activists or campaigners tend to fall into it. A lot of these types of people are critical thinkers, even on a sub subconscious level. It comes down to, if not me, then who? If not now, then when? For me, that was the powerful moment, Madison, because I asked you why you do it and, and that was your answer. If not me, then who? Now. Part of the work that you do with advocacy you highlight is for the workers and consumers. And we know that uh, it's invaluable and we're gonna to get to the big companies that you've exposed. But I guess, Michael, my first question to you is, you're a researcher, an ESG researcher. Was it a chicken and egg thing, research and then the advocacy or the other way around or, or, or how did that all fall into place? It, it came off the back of the work with 7-Eleven looking into the underpayment model. It was essentially um, you had to learn how to research to advocate for people because not everything is apparent when you're looking into an issue. And oftentimes corporates have, you know, many layers to um, uh, lift up before you can see the full level of misconduct. And we're going to to have a look and we, we might as well jump straight into it. So if we look at the 7-Eleven story, if you can give us a little bit of background and uh, on, on how it came about and then what happened in there and the fact that it had a journey through the media culminating with uh, Four Corners, but not, not just culminating there. I mean, it's been in the media on and off for a long time now for years. So Michael, take us through that briefly because we've got a lot to cover and I want to give Madison a chance to jump in as well. Well, yeah, basically 7-Eleven started with me living next door to a 7-Eleven and a, uh, I formed a friendship with a worker who said he wasn't being paid right. And I, I liked the guy and I wanted to help him and he kept getting frustrated with me saying, it's not me, it's everyone. And that led to me wanting to look into it further and I ended up going to three states and visiting 60 stores and realising that it was a widespread problem and even more so um, the concern was that I'd written to the company many times over and they told me on the phone, don't send us any evidence, we don't want it. Um, they had no interest in fixing the problem and that's when I realised that I needed to take it to someone and I went to the most credible person that I could think of in, in media, which was Adele Ferguson, and she did what I would call put, put it on steroids. So. 
I didn't really know how to research. I just had a problem and then she took it and turned it into an amazing thing that's led to change and 160 million back for over 3,000 7-Eleven workers. And um, it was one hell of a ride. It's the sheer volume of that story, not just in the hundreds of millions of dollars, but how many people were affected. Uh, and I think as I've read somewhere, we, we don't actually know if the entire problem has ever been resolved there, do we? No. So the, the hugeness of that, Madison, did that, has that ever worried you at all that these are, these are cases that are that massive? I mean, you look at Woolworths, you look at Domino's, you look at the um, retail food group. Well, it, it is quite remarkable when you really think about it. It's not just those people that have been helped who had back pay in all of those instances that you just mentioned, but it's the people who would have worked for them in the future as well. So it's, you can't really put a cap on it. it it's, it's ginormous. You haven't just helped the people that have had money back in their pockets. It's the people who would have fallen into the same trap and lost their money as well. Now, you guys um, expose what's happening here, but that's, that's not technically your aim here. It's not to take anyone down. It's to make change. Yep. And that's through uncovering the layers, let's say that in a kind way, um, that's through forcing them, whether they, you know, kicking and screaming often these big organisations, it's, it's forcing them to shine a spotlight on how internally they work and how they got into that mess to start with or perpetuate. Yeah, and it often starts with, and this is where we try and encourage people to, you know, that anyone can advocate is that when you realise that something doesn't pass the pub test. So you go into a business and you think, there's something really odd about this business model. I don't know why, but it feels wrong. In the case of 7-Eleven, it was that, you know, you know people were often, or in, in many cases, a migrant that could barely understand the language and, um, and they didn't seem to understand what fair work was or any of their rights. And, and I thought there must be something to this. And um, so, we, you know, that's when you dig deeper and you discover the true practices of a business. Madison, you, you're an ESG researcher and you specialise or uh, like to focus on franchises and ASX listed companies, etc. And you've told me that it's, it's the non-financial components. So investigating or looking into the way a company behaves often around their labour hire, um, are you surprised by how much poor performance is going on in, at a big level? When you first start looking into it, I think there's always an element of surprise, absolutely, because a lot of the time these are companies that present themselves as, you know, corporate, uh, corporate response, they demonstrate corporate responsibility, you know, they're responsible citizens in the corporate world. So when you sort of look past all of that PR and all that marketing spin and you really dig deep, of course, you know, there, there's always a little bit of surprise that these kind of companies are engaging in such practices. And, you know, it isn't always obvious. And a lot of the time, a lot of people have been impacted and they've tried to get the word out time and time again, but they haven't been believed or they don't have the evidence to, to back it up, to back up their claims. Um, and they, they really need people like, like advocates to really get in their corner and fight for them. And Madison, when, uh, as part of your research, when you're asked by one company to look into another company, is the, is the negative PR that can surround the, the wage theft or the underpayments so intense that it will stop one company from investing in another or taking over? Is, are they worried about the bad PR or the, the negative associated with ripping off people? Well, we normally, we normally look into the wage theft instances just on our own accord. We're not normally asked by, another, you know, by our clients to sort of expose bad conduct. Um, but oftentimes, you know, when bad conduct is, um, you know, publicly released and exposed i think a lot of investors in particular a lot of analysts suddenly have a lot of questions about why they're investing investing in such a company um, and whether they want to further invest their money and their clients money into that so you know th these, these are the kinds of questions that we we would very much encourage um, anybody who's looking at investing in companies to ask before they put their money into it because you don't want to surprise later you know these are very easy questions if something doesn't add up um, it, it's quite easy to research it just on the face level to see if it adds up. So 
you know, absolutely, we, we would encourage people to be asking this before it hits the media because it will. It will come out. It will come out. I think I think that's um, a given now. We're, we're seeing more and more of it come. Michael, I guess for me, um, what this means is that whilst um, you might be asked by uh, an ASX listed company to research and look into another company, in terms of the SME community, not only are they also vulnerable on not good practice, let's say, and, and need to be aware of, of how they are looking after their own staff and, and wage theft and underpayments, but the fact that they might be investing, whether it's part of their self-managed super fund or some other way, they might be investing in other companies. And it's, it's a serious thing to be not only putting your money somewhere and your future somewhere, but associating with a company whose intent is not necessarily ethical. It's a challenge there. It, it is. And we, you know, when our clients come to us, they're often just wanting to see if there is any problems there. And the way I would describe how we're approached is they say, you know, the company says there's a, a paddock and it's just full of green grass. We think there might be a boulder hidden in the grass and we want to find out if there is a boulder in the grass and we might look and find nothing and they feel happy about that. Or we might look and say, well, there wasn't a boulder, but there was this little rock over here and it may cause a problem when you mow the lawn. So that's sort of the way that we approach it. There's never an agenda. It's just simply to see, is there any risk not to hurt the company? And, um, and then they can take that information and make better, better informed decisions. And our research isn't a guarantee that, that there is nothing but they generally feel fairly confident that if we can't stumble across it, it's not, um, you know, bubbling at the surface and about to come out. Now, what I want to do is, is make sure that I have time to cover your software. And I also want to touch on Transurban. So uh, bearing in mind how, running, how much we're running out of time, we don't have that much to go. Um, I'm going to quote again here around Transurban and in particular, it's the toll charges and the tolls. So, we found it to be unethical at the very least how some toll road consumers were unknowingly racking up tens of thousands of dollars in toll fees. They would escalate to the government where fines were then incurred and penalties like losing your licence, garnishing wages, seizing vehicles and pulling, putting caveats on people's homes were all, all possibilities. So people are forced to pay for fees they didn't agree with and they didn't even know they had to pay. And sometimes their e-tag malfunctioned and they didn't realise until it was too late. Now, I've been a victim of this uh, myself and I'm, I'm lucky it was contained in a small way. But when you, when you told me, Madison, that people garnished, they were garnishing their wages, they were seizing their cars and, and putting caveats on their homes, surely this is unethical at the very least. It's, it's absolutely insane and you just you don't know how it could possibly ever get to that level. I think the most common thing that we hear is, well, why did they pay for the tolls? Um, you know, why did these people let it get to this point? And, and it's a very hard mindset to cut through. Um, but at the end of the day, if you don't know what's happening, how can you act on it? A lot of the time... That's, that's right. Act, a lot of this was happening without anyone being aware until it was actually too late. Yes. Yeah, so, you know, the company could have the wrong address. It could have been the vehicle was in someone else's name. They could have just sold the vehicle. Something's happened along the way where they weren't alerted to the fact that these tolls were going unpaid. Um, you know, a credit card could have changed. Very, very simple errors. You're not constantly thinking, I need to change. I need to make sure that my toll tag is up to date. You know, so very, very simple errors that can result in a $30,000 debt quite quickly. Um, to be honest. So, yeah, you know, it is, it's very alarming. And we have had instances of people who have had their house um, ha have a caveat put on it and vehicles being um, seized as well. So very, very serious problems that have a lasting impact on people's mental health as well. It's, it's very serious. Of course, because you, you don't real, you don't want to believe that it can happen to you in that way. And, and how systemic is this? Is this right across Australia? Along the East Coast, yeah, it's, we've had thousands and thousands of people contact us. It's overwhelming, to be honest. We can't. Can we just can we just repeat that, Madison? Because I, I want to highlight that thousands and thousands of people contacting you about this. Yeah, we actually don't have the number because they come to us on all channels. You know, they call us up at midnight yeah. out of the blue. You know, so thousands. Yeah. 
And, and that was what shocked me the most. So this is definitely something we want to be keeping an eye on. Um, very quickly, Michael, can we just touch on the software that you've developed? Yeah, so the software is something that we built for ourselves originally because we're often searching government data and you know, the government has a habit of putting some data up and taking it down or not structuring it properly. And it makes our job very hard to do research. And um, especially when something was published and now it's taken down like a daily court record, for example. So we started building this tool for ourselves to aggregate government data to make it easy to search and, re and get reports. And then what happened is our clients started asking for it. And now, you know, many of the main news outlets uh, uh, are using this software to get reports every day, which are essentially, you know, you might be able to find out all the court matters that went in the New South Wales court that day that were published that day or all the federal court filings or all the submissions to uh, federal parliament. And normally as a journalist, you'd be searching through all those things trying to find, um, you know, what's changed in the day. It's very time consuming and painful and their website often breaks. So that's why we built this tool, um, just to make research easy and to put all that. It's, it's almost like a Google of government data. You're curating, right? You, you, you're making that government data accessible. It's staying around. Um, it's easy to comprehend. I mean, you did a quick search on me and I came up in two instances in um, New South Wales Parliament, one I wasn't aware of, one I was aware of. It's quite yeah, intriguing what you can find. Oh, it'll blow your mind what we find all the time. And what we say is, you know, sometimes journalists say, I didn't find the smoking gun. Actually, you had that today with a journalist today. But what it is, it's, it should be the start of your research. So it's about what exists about this person or this company, and then you can go from there and research. So if you don't know a company has been sued, then you can go and get the statement of claim um, once you find that in our system and then start learning about the ethics of that company. So that's what we do. We call it the start of our research. And the thing is, Google does not get um, quite a bit of data that you think they may get. And they also don't structure the data in a way that you can make sense of it. Uh, you know, parliamentary submissions don't link to the inquiry, things like that. So with our system, we make it uh, you know, it's a much more structured, easily accessible central place for government data. Because you've realised what you need to do your research. And again, I'm going to come back to the, the chicken and the egg with you guys, because the work that you do involves the research, which means that you're going to find things out about a company, which leads to perhaps exposing or, or pointing out issues, which leads to your advocacy, which again, all around comes back to the consulting and then the reason for the software. So what you've done is you've, you've highlighted where you needed help and that help then flows on and, and helps other people and, and journalists and the media is one and, and helping people find out information about where something's gone wrong is another. So you, you two must be feeling very proud of yourselves for being able to actually not just make a difference in one person's life but enact change on a bigger level. It's a, it's a struggle because, you know, you can't help everybody. So, you know, as much as we, we feel relieved that some people have had help, you know, we still have many others that have come to us that we haven't been able to help. So, you know, it's like it's hard to feel proud when you have all these people that you can't help, you know, so, yeah. And something I'm passionate about, really passionate about is helping people work out how they can help themselves so they don't yes. need to go to an advocate and that they don't escalate things. Because most people who come to us, you know, so many have spent 40,000 with the lawyer to get nowhere. Um, the, the lawyers got everything wrong and made things worse. The person um, has got themselves in a bit of trouble because they got frustrated and they've been a bit abusive. So it's just about taking a peaceful approach and getting everything in writing and you know, uh, giving a company an opportunity to uh, succeed or fail in helping you. And then going from there, to you know, other options that uh, may expose that company for the misconduct if they don't wish to fix it or acknowledge it. So it's important to share with um, our viewers that when you need to advocate for yourself, it's almost like a mind map approach, if we can give it a visual context, on going through the layers like you do as researchers. You know, if you've got an issue, start step by step on how to deal with it, document it along the way, Try not to lose your cool. It's not about 
abuse. It, it's not going to get you very far. Remember the goal where you're going is is achieving to either fix the problem that you've got, have the, you know, the charges dropped, the financial charges dropped or have something replaced. Or It, it might be a small issue, but it, it could end up escalating to a large one. But it's, it's very much about going through those steps. Is that right, Madison, when you are trying to advocate for yourself? Honestly, the biggest tip that we have for, for anybody, and it's so easy, is to get it in writing. So if you have a complaint or there's something that's happened, don't call, email. It's going to be, it's going to protect you. And the company should feel at ease too, the one that you're complaining about, because it's also protecting them because everybody yes. has a written trail. You know, everybody knows what's going on. That's the it's not a he said, she said, she yeah. and he and exactly. she and she. <laughs> it biggest, comes down to that. Easiest tip Thank you can... so much for both of you for joining us today. Um, we not only appreciate your time, but I want to say on behalf of lots of people that you have helped, thank you. Uh, and we offer you SME TV as a way of helping lots of other people too, because on our friend or foe segment, we highlight people who have been friends or foes of SMEs. And that, that's the purpose of this and what we didn't. Actually, this is why we started SME TV. So that's why I get really excited about talking to you. To all our viewers out there, if you haven't pressed subscribe, you need to subscribe to SME TV and share it. A big shout out to the SMEA Association for all the great work that they do and for supporting SME TV. Another big shout out to Piedmont Studio who make us look and sound good. And anyone out there, if you are having a challenge or an issue with anyone, you can reach us directly, news at smea.org.au. I will forward on your content or your challenge to Michael and Madison if they can help you as well, but otherwise we'll do our best to. Catch you all next time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Madison. Thank, Thank you. you.